There we go. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Well, hopefully you can see my screen now. So we are, I saw someone ask, is this about assessment? Yes, it is about assessment. I think it's funny that we're going to be, I'll use the term grading a lot, but really we're talking about what's a system that we're setting up to support meaningful assessment. And so that's really what we're talking about is what is meaningful assessment? And it's not just, here's your grade at the end of the term, but how do we take that process and truly turn it into a process? And the subtitle for this is grading for the future. And I mean that for two reasons. And one is because I want students to be using grading and assessment and reporting as something that points them towards where they're going. Because that's when it's really meaningful. The other reason that I wanted to use the, the subtitle grading for the future is because a lot of our grading systems are based around how we used to deliver content. They're based around the fact that the teacher was the vehicle for content delivery and everybody had to move at the same pace. And so that's the grading system that a lot of us still operate in. And so we're looking for if, if we are in a new age where the answers to almost everything are available on the internet and students can learn at different paces, are we creating grading systems that work for that? And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. But I wanna start with the most important thing I can say today. And it's this. You just went through probably one of the most stressful years of your career, right? We are coming to the end of an year that, uh, that you didn't sign up for, right? This, is, this wasn't the type of teaching that we all expected when we got into this profession, yet time and time again through getting to work with teachers around Washington State, I've gotten to see so many incredible things where teachers are there for their kids. It wasn't what you imagined, and yet so often teachers were still there. And so for that, I have to say thank you. And even if you felt like you didn't make a difference, I got an email from a student as I was kind of sending my wrap up emails and checking in on students. One of them said, I said, hey, I haven't seen you much, just checking in, how are you doing? They said, sorry, I haven't been there a lot, but it was really nice to know that you were there for me. And I think even though we haven't felt that through this spring, I have to say thank you because there are kids all over that knew that there was a teacher there for them. Even if they weren't engaging, you were there for them. And so I have to say thank you for that. I have to say thank you for you being here in June in something that is probably your last week of school to talk about teaching and learning, right? That shows me that you are passionate teachers and you do great things for kids just because you're willing to show up and continue learning. So for that, I say thank you. I also wanna say thank you for what we're going into in the fall. We, we have so much uncertainty. We don't know what it's gonna look like. And yet you have put in so much work this spring and I know that you're gonna continue doing some of this learning now and you're going to be ready for the fall and you're going to do incredible things for the fall. And so even though we're not even there yet, I feel like you'd already deserve a thank you for what you're going to do in the fall. So no matter what happens here, I want you to get that message that you have done incredible things and you deserve to hear it probably more often than you do. So thank you. So a quick introduction to who I am. My name is Tyler Rablin. I am first and foremost, a high school English teacher. I get to work one period a day with my freshmen. I never thought I would enjoy teaching freshmen. I always loved teaching the older kids because I felt like we could have better conversations. And then one year they gave me freshmen and I dreaded it until I experienced the joy of teaching freshmen. It's incredible. I love teaching freshmen. It's one of my favorite things to do. So I still get one class period a day of English 9 with my freshman group. And then I spend the rest of my day as an instructional tech coach. And it's, it's been a shift for me, but what I've learned is so important. It's, I love that the fact that my job is to open doors. Teachers come to me with incredible ideas and we get to work together to make them happen. And really when we talk about grading, that open door analogy is gonna carry through because I wanna create grading systems. I wanna create an educational experience that doesn't close doors, but it opens them. And grading is one of the foundational pieces that makes a huge difference in that. I also get the opportunity to work with Jeff and the rest of the Reimagine Why Ed team. It has been a great experience to see what's going on around the state and just get blown away by teachers and, and districts all over. There's incredible things happening. I also, if, you're, if you want to hear more about my passion around teaching and, and learning, I, I share most of my thinking through a blog called Teacher Totter. And there's also a YouTube channel that has some tech tutorials, but honestly, they're not great. So go to the blog. That's, that's kind of my pitch. Uh, go to the blog, not the YouTube channel. I did put together, you know, one of the things about professional learning is in a lot of the research, they say it takes 14 hours of learning around a topic to truly impact kids. And I had to recognize that we have an hour together. And so I put together some resources that are going to take what we'll talk about today and give you places to go with it to keep this learning rolling. So I have two different links there. If you type one of those in, you'll be able to get to the resource page that should take you to 
some of those resources that you'll, you'll be able to dive into later to keep this learning going. I am gonna click to the next slide, but I promise the link is still there for those of you still typing. Quick overview of what we're doing today. So here's our structure. The first thing we're gonna do is really identify the problem. I'm gonna push for some new ideas around grading and assessment for some of us, and there's no sense looking at change if we're not gonna to try to identify is there a problem, right? It's that idea of if it's not broken, why are we trying to fix it? And I had to go through this process of seeing where my grading system was broken. And so I'm gonna share that story as a way to try to convince us that there's something that needs to be fixed, that there's a way we can do it better. And it was a hard process for me, and so I'll share my story as my way of getting us through that. And then we'll talk a lot about the purpose of a grade, because this is where a lot of assessment systems, where, where things kind of change from what we know grading should be to where it ends up being in practice in our classroom. And so we'll talk about the purpose of that, and then we'll really look into some of the nitty gritty, what are the structures that need to be in place? How do we set up grade books to facilitate the purpose of, of grading and learning that we're talking about? And then at the end, I'll show a few quick takeaways of just really tips and tricks for how we can make this process work well, whether we are in the classroom or not. So that's what we're doing today. But I have a request before I start. I, my second year of teaching, I got to be on a committee that was looking at standards-based grading and shifting the whole school to standards-based grading. And I learned very quickly that if you ever wanna start a fight with educators, talk about grading. And so here's my request. There are gonna be things that I say today that are gonna make you feel a little like this. And I can't see you, but I'm gonna feel you glaring like this ostrich. You're just gonna have this like arms crossed sitting back like, I can't believe you said that. And here's, here's my request. I don't mind if you're uncomfortable or frustrated with it. I think it's good. My request is that you don't shut off because of it. Because I will tell you for me, for far too long, I thought I had the answer. And I shut down and shut off when people would disagree with me, when, it, when I got uncomfortable and felt like I was being challenged. And because of that, I think I did things in my classroom that weren't great for kids. And so I'll ask when you're uncomfortable or when I say something that might push a button, don't shut off yet, right? Listen all the way through the end and then you can determine if, if you wanna roll with it or not, but don't shut off. The other thing I'll say is some of you might feel like this poor little owl who looks way overwhelmed. I'm gonna talk some big picture things and I'm gonna have the same encouragement for you. If you're overwhelmed, don't shut off because there's a place to start. We're gonna talk about the end and then we'll, I'll give you some places that you can start. And so as we talk about grading and assessment, my request is that you lean in. So let's start by talking about the problem. And I told you I'm gonna frame the problem with my own story. And this story starts with me walking down to the office at the very last day of school, kind of like what we're doing now, except I had to print out my grades because nobody trusted technology. So I had my papers in my hand and I'm walking down the hallway to the office. And I had this moment of looking down at my grade book. And I asked myself this question, what did it tell me? And I looked at it and I, and I had this question of, this should tell me the story of my students learning. And I was looking at it and all I knew was what my students had done. I had a list of their tasks and how they did with them. And the harder part for me to grapple with is when I was looking at my students that failed, when I asked the question of why did they fail, I couldn't clearly say that it's because they didn't know what they needed to know. The only answer I had is they didn't do what they were supposed to do and that's why they had an F in my class. And that was hard for me because I knew there were students who were passing my class who didn't know the content, as well as some of the students that were failing. They just did the right thing. They played the game of school better than the students that failed. And the other piece that it really made me think about is it forced me to look back to the conversations I was having with my students in class. And so often those conversations were based around tasks. They would ask, you know, I would hand back something that had feedback in a grade and the only question I was getting is why is this my score? Why did I get this grade on it? And we weren't having conversations about learning. We were having conversations about compliance and about tasks and about doing what you were supposed to do. And I wanted those conversations to be about learning. And the last piece that really struck me is I realized through those conversations that students didn't see the value of grading. And I will challenge you, the piece that really stuck home for me is I asked my students, do grades help you learn? I ask them this every year. 
And it's painful to hear because almost instantly, most of them say, no, they don't. And there's a few kids that say, yes, they do. But when I push them further on why, they say, because it makes me do my work. And that's the more painful answer to hear because that means the student doesn't know the difference between doing and learning. And that's a huge difference. And so this was sort of the problem that I faced in my classroom. And when, when we look at remote learning, I know a lot of us are feeling some of this around grading right now because the grade was taken away and what happened? We lost a lot of engagement. We lost a lot of the motivation of students doing this. And I know we really wanna get back to a spot where we can slap grades on things and use those to push students to do their work. But I would encourage you to think about, are we trying to treat the symptom or cure the disease? Because the symptom is that they stop doing the work. The disease is that we're so focused on extrinsic motivation with our grading systems that students don't understand what it means to be truly intrinsically motivated. And when I really focus on the problem with grades in my classroom, what forced me to look at a new way of doing things, it really came down to the fact that I was using grades as an ex extrinsic motivator. Right, and what's the problem with it? The problem is that it works, which sounds really weird, right? But it does work in the short term. We can get students to do what we want them to do. We can get them to comply. And it makes life easier for us and for the systems, but I would argue it doesn't make things better for the kids. And here's the other piece, is that that extrinsic motivation, it loses value over time, right? So we have to continually be upping the ante, which just reinforces this system of do what you're supposed to do so you can get your compensation, right? We view it almost like a vending machine. The kid gives us work and we give them a grade and that's the exchange that goes on. But this isn't even the biggest problem for me with the extrinsic motivation. It's the fact that it only works for some kids. I would argue it doesn't actually work for any kids, but in terms of getting students to engage in the behaviors we want, the extrinsic motivation works for the kids that it works for. But for the kids that have reinforced ideas that you can't do it, right? If, if we're using extrinsic motivation, there's carrots for some and the kids that consistently get the sticks. Right? The kids that are getting punished by grades, it's reinforcing this idea of who they are as a learner. And if you've seen John Hattie's research around visible learning, effect number two, if anyone knows it and you have really fast typing skills, you can put it in the chat. Effect number two, meaning the second most powerful thing we can do with students, the second biggest impact on learning, he calls it at first self-reporting of grades, which it took me a little bit to wrap my head around. I had to dig into it. But what it means is the student's perception of what they can achieve is the second biggest impact we can have on student learning is to help them see themselves as learners. And my concern is that if we're constantly focusing grades on extrinsic motivation, we're, we're taking this possibility, this possibility of truly making a difference for students, and we're doing it in a way that harms those students. And so when I thought about this problem and I thought about my grades, I realized that the big problem is that I was using grades as the central piece of my classroom. Meaning the central piece of my classroom had nothing to do with the passions and intrinsic motivations of my students, but it had to do with extrinsic motivation and getting them to do what I wanted them to do. And I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't times where we do want to convince students to do one certain thing. Right? That, that, that's not off the table. But what I'm saying is that was the focus of my classroom because the grading system I had in place was the foundation. And from that foundation grew a classroom based on extrinsic motivation. And so I had to relook at that foundation and really focus on what's my ideal. Because if I'm constantly focused on the problem, I don't know where to go. And so I had to do a ton of research and reading and figuring out where am I going? If I was doing this perfectly, What's my ideal? And the first thing that I had to think about is, am I getting meaningful data? I had a ton of numbers before, but it wasn't meaningful. And by meaningful data, I mean, does it tell me where each student needs to go next? Because that's when it's really meaningful. I wanted a grading system in my ideal classroom that encouraged us to talk about learning, not about tasks. Because the conversations are about, about learning are what really make a difference. I want my classroom to be focused on learning, not distracted by the tasks that they're engaging in to get them to the learning. In my ideal, I really, this idea of intrinsic motivation, I couldn't get past that because when you think about creating lifelong learners, people that are ready for the real, the real world and gonna be successful, 
those are people that understand where their intrinsic motivation is. And I wanted my classroom to start fostering that. And this really gets down to, can we create a grading system that allows students to have ownership over that process? Because so often assessment is something that's done to students. They have no control over it. It's something where they show up, they turn something in, and then the assessment, the grading is done to them and they have no control over it, where really a lot of the meaning out of grading comes from conversations around asking students, where are you at? Where do you need to go next? And giving them some of that ownership. And so I knew this was my ideal. This is where I wanted to go. And I think it's important, I have this slide here because it's important for, for me to answer this question, am I there yet? I won't pretend to be there. I will never be there. And I think the, it's important for you to hear that because the day that I think I'm there is the day that I stop being someone you should pay attention to. Because I worry sometimes that we look to people who say they have it all figured out, but really that, what that means is I've stopped listening. I don't think there's been a year or a trimester where I haven't tweaked something about my grading system because I'm constantly trying to make it better. And so I'm not gonna tell you right now that I have all of the answers because I don't think there's anyone that does. But what I'll tell you is I have a story of starting in a place where kids were completely driven by extrinsic motivation and getting to a place now where we're moving more towards intrinsic motivation and a grading system that fosters that. So here's where we have to start. What is the purpose? And so often we skip past this and we start talking about how does the grading happen? But I wanna stop and say, why does grading happen? Right? What is the purpose of grading in the classroom? And this part actually isn't that tricky. Because I think most of us, if not all of us, would agree that the point of grading and reporting is to accurately communicate current levels of learning. That's really why we do it, right? Because we want to tell students, here's where you're at. Now, there's some stuff where there are some secondary or tertiary reasons, but we have to pay attention to the fact that this is the primary function of grading to communicate to all stakeholders, us, the student, parents, administration, future teachers, to communicate this is where the student's at in their learning. Now where this gets tricky is when we put rubber to the road. And so I wanna present a, a little scenario for you. And here's the setup. You have two students, student A, student B. Pretty easy setup so far. In your class, they have five attempts at a standard. We might call it assignments. I'm gonna call it attempts at a standard and you'll see why later. Student A does all five of them and they show proficiency, right? Through all five of those assignments, they've shown that they know the content. Student B does only two, but in those two assignments, they demonstrate that they learned the content. And here's the challenge. What grades do those two students receive? Because so often we know the purpose of a grade is to communicate learning, but in our classrooms, these two students get different grades. And that's where I had the hardest time with it, right? Because I knew I wanted to communicate grades. I wanted to, or I wanted to communicate learning, but I was letting other factors get in the way. And I'll tell you a story really quick of why this matters to me. It was my, my third year of teaching right after I'd realized there was something wrong with my grading and I was trying to figure out what to do and I remember this student in one of my intervention classes named Tiffany. She had a, not a great life. And in, in our diagnostic assessment, I've never seen a student get the scores as high as she did. She, she knew it, she got it. Throughout the course of the term, she hardly turned anything in. We had great conversations, but I had hardly anything to show for it. And yet on almost every single test she took, she had some of the highest marks. And I got to the end of the trimester and I had to look at this and look at a student that I knew understood the content, that I knew knew everything that they needed. And they had an F in my class, right? And, and if I go back to my purpose of grading where it's communicating levels of learning and that student that understands it better than anyone else in the class is failing, then I'm not holding to my purpose. And, and here's, I'm, Here's where I know a lot of you are at right now, because I can't see you, but I can feel it through the screen. You're sitting there like this at your computer. This idea of like, this is ridiculous because, and here's what you're thinking to yourself, but what about behavior? If students don't learn to do things, they're never gonna be successful in the workplace. And I'm not gonna argue with you, but 
I'm going to present you with another scenario. Here's our setup. We've got our same students, student A and student B. This time, there's a late work penalty of 20%. And I know this is not uncommon. This is used in a ton of classrooms. And I have used it in my classroom before. Student A completes their work on time and they demonstrate proficiency, which I'm not a huge fan of the 100 point scale, but let's say for the sake of this, that's an 80%. That's proficiency. Student A completes their work late, but they demonstrate mastery, which is 100% for the sake of this scenario. Now both students end up with an 80%. And if our purpose of grading is to clearly communicate learning and learning needs, which 80% accurately communicates learning needs? And I know as I say that, some of you are probably, we've, we've gone from the cat to this, right? Like you've gone from the grumpy cat to you're ready to like rip into me at this point. Because you're, you're feeling like I'm just telling you to disregard behavior. Right, that all that matters is content. And I completely disagree with that. What I'm saying is we should probably look at the research on late penalties and their long-term effects on behavior and learning outcomes. And the problem is that there isn't any. There's nothing that says late penalties improve long-term behavior and learning outcomes. What they do is they improve short-term outcomes. They improve compliance. They improve, and I've seen studies that say it improves achievement, but achievement is defined as the grade in the class. And now we're stuck in this cycle of research issues. But here's why it doesn't create long-term outcomes. Because when we combine elements, we end up with a lack of clarity, which makes about as much sense as this made-up word that I have called con behave tent, where I've smashed content and behavior together, and it's nonsensical. And I would argue that if I'm going to do that in my grades, I need to be telling my students the purpose of a grade is to communi communicate con behave tent. And I'll just wait for the look I get from them. Because what we should be doing, and this is where, you know, if there are elementary teachers in here right now, you're probably listening to this going, that is a ridiculous system because elementary teachers crush it here. Because this is what most elementary report cards look like. It clearly communicates those two separately. Where we have content, and I'm putting it in quotes because I hate the term soft skills. Because when you were talking about the importance of talking, as if you were talking, when you were thinking about the importance of behavior and those life skills of being the person that shows up on time, being the person that, that is trustworthy and reliable, those matter. But I think if we're, if we're communicating them together in that one grade, we're cheapening that. So here's what I would say is a better alternative. What if we communicated the two separately? Because if the point of all of this is to communicate the learning needs, where the student needs to grow, if we smash it together and give both students an 80%, we don't know what they need to work on. They don't know what they need to work on. But if we separate it out, it becomes way more clear that student A could continue working on the content and student E needs to have a conversation about timeliness. And, and the reason that I separate these two apart is so often we associate accountability with teaching. And they're not the same thing. Penalizing a student for not doing something on time is very different from teaching them to be on time. And so when I separate them out, it clearly tells me what I need to be working on with the student next. To show you that I'm not just making this up, this is a picture of my gradebook from trimester one this year. You'll notice in green and blue are my content skills. In red and yellow are the soft skills, the behavior. Now, this is a point that I wanna emphasize. The piece that goes into the summation grade, the, sum, the, the summative grade that students get at the end are green and blue. The pieces that I talk to my students about are red and yellow. And I will say the, the value for me in separating these two out is the red and yellow columns are the conversations I have with students. Right? I don't just assign these separately, but I sit down with students and I have them self-assess, which is where a lot of the value in assessment comes from. How are you doing with problem solving, with creative thinking, and getting them to engage in that, that process? When I lump things together and penalize for some of this behavior, we don't have good conversations. We have conversations that typically, typically hurt the relationship and hinder some of the teaching and learning going forward. But by separating it out and allowing students to engage in that process themselves, now we're in a spot where we're really focused on some self-reflection and thinking about where are the areas you need to grow. So I showed you my grade book, which means we're starting to talk about structure. 
So if we are really at a spot where the point of a grade is to communicate learning, one of the biggest barriers is almost always how our grade book is set up. And so I wanna talk about how do we set up a grade book that really puts learning first. And the first thing that it has to be is standards based. And I wanna be clear when I say standards based, that's different than standards referenced. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. But the value in having a standards based grade book, not only does it put the emphasis on learning, but when we talk about standards based, what we're really doing is opening doors for choice, we're opening doors for autonomy. And I'll show you what I mean by that, by giving you two different grade books. On the left, we have what my grade book looked like for my first few years teaching. I had tasks identified with the score down below. And what, I, what I'll press on is when we look at a grade book like that, where is the choice? For quiz one, the choice is do the quiz or don't do the quiz. That's the extent of the choice with that grade book set up. We might have some room when we look towards the final project, there might be some choice there, but there's not real authentic choice in a grade book that specifies the task they have to complete. And so on the right, we have a grade book that is focused on learning. And when you think about it, that grade, that score for analyzing theme, how could students engage in that? If we have a student who is passionate about film, can they do that through their passion? Absolutely. If we have a student that's passionate about music, can they do that through their passion? Absolutely. And so the, the reason that this is so important to me that we're focusing grade books on standards is because the, the message we send when we tell students we're giving you a choice, the message we send to them is I want you to bring your whole self into this classroom that you matter more than the content. You matter more than the tasks I'm asking you to engage in. And I know it sounds silly to equate that message with the setup of a grade book, but I found it to be so true with my students. The times that I say, here's what I want you to learn, but I want you to do it in a way that works for you. When we talk about intrinsic motivation, Daniel Pink has his three factors and autonomy is one of the big factors of intrinsic motivation. The ability to say, this is how I'm going to do it, to make a choice and have control over that process. And I have found that setting up my grade book with the standards is how I can really get there in a meaningful way. So again, here's what mine looks like. You'll notice that I have, and I'll use my mouse so you can see, green and blue. Each one of these is one of my targets for the trimester. One of the things I want my students to learn. And here is my favorite part about this. So I, in the resource page that you can actually click a button to make a copy of my gradebook template if you want it. I use a tool called Autocrat with Sheets so that I can send an individual report to each student that looks like this. And the key here is that there is no assignment listed on this. Because the instant you put an assignment on a report that you give to students, that's the conversation you're going to have. Right? Because students are so concerned with, did I do what I was supposed to do? Because they're used to playing, by the time they're a senior, a 13-year game of follow the leader to make sure they get the best score, that if they have tasks on there, they just want to know, did I do the right thing? Did I follow the steps I was supposed to follow? And so I took that off there completely. Because I didn't, like I said before, one of the problems is that I was having conversations about tasks. And that's not the conversation I wanted to have. I wanted to have conversations about learning. And so when you look at this, it's almost impossible to have a conversation about tasks when you've taken tasks out of the equation. And so, you know, I will say this is, I have never seen a grading program that does this as well as I would like, but however you do it, make the emphasis taking the task out of the spotlight, right? I, I have had grade book setups where I simply had an assignment with the learning target labeled because it was the best way I could do it with the grading program I had, but the goal, is if you take the task away, the conversation becomes around learning. And my favorite part, this is the back of the report I give to my students, where we get to really reflect on how are we doing in our growth in learning, right? What are the skills that you're proud of? What are, what are some of the ways that you've pushed yourself? And these were conversations I never had when I was emphasizing tasks, when I was focusing on the assignments students needed to do. And so when I took those away and focused on learning, those assignments ended up getting richer, or those conversations ended up getting richer and richer and richer. Now, one thing I want to add here, because it might be helpful to some people, 
When we talk about choice and standards, one of the hardest things to figure out is if you're going to give students choice and send them out different ways, how do we assess that? Right? And, and one of the things that I have found is it's a really hard to keep track of because it's easy for them all to do the same task and put it in one spot. But when they go off and do different things, it's really hard to keep track of what they're doing and grade it. And so what I found is it's helpful to have a place for them to come back. And yes, identify the task. I love seeing some of the things my students create when I give them choice. It's incredible. I had a student who I asked them to respond to what's going on in the world today and she wrote a rap. And she's one of my EL students that I would have never expected to be confident enough to do that and she did it and blew me away. And so I would say choice matters there because students are gonna go outside the box and show you incredible things. But when it comes down to it, I wanna know through this task, through this process, what did you learn? And so you'll notice at the bottom of this, there's that yellow section is all about what did you learn? Explain your learning to me. And I found when I have those conversations with students, those conversations tell me more about where they're at in their learning than a test ever can. Because I, it's so much richer and deeper and it's so personal. And I know it's hard in this remote environment to figure out how do we have those conversations. So that's one of the things I will try to show you at the end is how do we still do some of those same things. But I think if we have that conversation piece of students able to say, here's where I'm at in my learning, here's what I've learned through this process, that makes it easier on our end to assess because it's in one spot, but it becomes a more meaningful assessment for the student. So that's part one of setting up your grade book. Focus on the learning, not the tasks. If there's any way to take the tasks, the assignments out of there and just put the learning in there, you're gonna find you have more meaningful conversations with students about the things that matter. Here's the second piece that I think is so important in setting up a grade book. Do you have space in your grade book for students to demonstrate multiple attempts at mastery? Right, and that's when we I talked about Daniel Pink's work on intrinsic motivation, mastery is one of his three elements. And, and a story that has really cemented this for me is I think about I was teaching a junior class, it was called American Lit C. And American Lit C was students that didn't pass A, maybe passed B, and they were shoved into C because they needed a credit. And so Daniel's in this class, and I, you know, he hardly moved the whole time, right? Like I'd tell him to do things and he didn't really care that much. And then one day, I had been toying with this idea of mastery. And so I, I just gave, and it's silly now to look back, but I gave a Google form where if they got 100%, they got a little silly badge. And I have never seen that student work that hard, right? Like most students, two, three, four attempts, they got it, they were done. He did four, five, six, seven. By the end of class, he had finally gotten 100%. And I stopped him on the way out the door and I said, Daniel, I've never seen you engage in learning that deeply. What's going on? And, and what he said stucks with me, sticks with me today is he said, I've never had someone tell me they expect me to get 100%. And if I think so often with my students, I've told them, you got a 70%, that's good enough, let's move along. And I, when, I real, when I think back on the message that sends is that I don't think you can get 100% or I don't have time for you to get 100%. And so when we can figure out a way to allow students to engage deeply in a way where they can pursue mastery, we're telling them, I believe in you, right? I've created a way for you to get mastery of this content. And, and a couple of reasons why, and this, I love this article, it's from the 80s, which the idea of mastery learning was really getting off the ground at that point. And yet they were able to find 25 studies that really looked at a mastery learning approach and here's one of the reasons I think it's so powerful is it increases overall achievement for everybody. Right at the bottom, if you, if you read through, in no study did students under control conditions perform better than those under mastery conditions. In no study. Granted, this is 25. It's not a huge sample size. But even out of that, to have no spot where students under normal conditions perform better than students under mastery conditions, that's incredible. But this is the piece that I think is really important. And I'm gonna come back to this phrase, group-based mastery learning. But it affected positively how students feel about the subject they're studying and most importantly, how they feel about themselves as learners. And if we look back at what John Hattie says, one of the most powerful things we can do for students is to increase their ability to see their value as a learner. 
and mastery-based learning has a positive effect on that view for students. The other piece, and I'm gonna to try to explain this one, is there's so much potential in mastery-based learning to close achievement gaps. Now I recognize this doesn't address some major underlying systemic issues, but in terms of what we can control in our classroom, if we think about, if we had the opportunity to close the achievement gap, why wouldn't we do it? And mastery-based learning is a way that we can. Now some of the language I don't like in here, they use the term slow learner. But what it says is it's, it's possible to increase the rate of learning that a student has. And I think so often we look at students and we think, ah, oh, they're behind, they're going to continue to be behind. But here's the analogy that I would use. If a student comes into your class with 70% of the tools and another student comes in with 100% of the tools and we're asking them to build a house, of course the student with 70% of the tools is gonna be slower. Does that mean it's a fault of them or that there's something wrong with them? No, it means that they're coming in with 30% missing and that's going to slow them down. And so the, the idea behind a mastery model is instead of telling students keep going without 30% of the tools and good luck, let's give them everything that they need to be successful because that will end up increasing their rate of learning because it's really hard to keep pace with someone who has 100% of something when you have 70%. And so these three reasons, if nothing else, these are the reasons why mastery matters. And I know the reason it doesn't happen often in schools isn't because it's valuable, it's because it's a logistical nightmare. So we're gonna take a quick little detour where I'll talk about some of the structures in my place or in my classroom that have made this possible. But one of the things that you have to start by thinking about is the fact that out of these two elements, time and learning, there's always a fixed piece and a variable. And in most classrooms, time is the fixed piece. You have four weeks for this unit, which means the learning is the variable. At the end of four weeks, if you're at 70% and another kid's at 100, that means that learning was variable for different students. I've linked Sal Khan's video uh, in the resource page about his TED talk about mastery. And I love the analogy he uses is he, he says, you know, if we think about this in terms of building a house, if you give someone two weeks to build a foundation, then the inspector comes and says 70%. And then you say, okay, let's, we got to move on to the first floor. And the inspector comes and gives it a 70%. The whole house is going to collapse. And it's not because the, cons the, the contractor was a bad contractor. It's because the system was flawed. And so I think a lot of times when we have time as the fixed piece in this equation and learning as the variable, that's the flaw in the system. And so what would it look like if we flipped it? Where time is the variable so that learning becomes the fixed element that everybody is going to learn. That's a non-negotiable, time's the negotiable. And this is the piece, when I started down this road, I made the mistake of thinking that everyone should be working independently all the time because I didn't know how else to manage kids working at different paces and being in different spots. I just thought, you know, let's give them all nice neat packages and they can work through that at their own pace. And what I'd realized is I gave them a really shiny packet called a Chromebook. And I had to rethink the fact that the point of mastery based learning isn't that they're working independently, but that they're learning what they need to learn at the time they need to learn it. And they can do that with other people who are learning different things. So here are some of the elements that have been really helpful for me in a mastery model. The first one, and I wanna identify this first because this is a, a capacity you're building right now in remote learning. You have to leverage asynchronous content for mastery learning to be a possibility because you have one mouth. You can't say 30 things to 30 kids at the same time, but if you're leveraging asynchronous content, you can. Small group instruction is crucial. And this is where I will say my wife is a, third, fourth, and fifth grade teacher. And I'll come home and be like, hey, I showed two different YouTubes to my, two YouTube videos to my kids and taught them two different things. And she's like, cool, we're running four different reading groups with different levels of text and all of my kids are learning something different. And I'm like, okay, well, elementary rocks and we got a ways to go in secondary. But small group instruction, we don't leverage it enough. But I think in a mastery model, it's so crucial. The other piece that I wanna make sure is in here Class discussions aren't off the table because kids are working independently. Most of my class, and I'll show you the structure of how my weeks are set up. Most of my class or my weeks start with a class discussion around an anchor text or a mentor text because we can start there and then go our different ways. And it's helpful to have common language that all students can talk about. The other thing that I love, a lot of times I'll start a week with a discussion where it's a class discussion, but the question is, what did you learn last week? And every student can participate. 
And that's my favorite thing where every student can say, here's what I'm learning. And they get to hear people who are learning different things. And now we have cross pollination of ideas and we're getting a richer, deeper understanding of content that way. The last two elements are crucial. Formative assessment has to be one of the foundational elements of mastery learning. And I mean formative assessment in its most basic form where students are able to take a formative assessment again and again, because the point of formative assessment is to say, okay, yesterday I was here, where am I at today? Where am I gonna be at tomorrow? And with that, frequent feedback. And hopefully if I can talk faster, I'll be able to show you a little bit of the tricks that I've been able to use to make that feedback faster and more meaningful. But these are some of the elements that if we're talking about students working at different paces and having different attempts at mastery in a grade book, these pieces are still part of the class. But before I even show you the structure of my system, I want to tell you something that I learned that's so important. The first attempt that I made at a mastery model, I knew it was so important for kids to be able to learn at their own pace and to take multiple attempts at a standard. And so I packaged something where students were working at their own pace. But what I learned is that if it's not driven by a meaningful purpose, it doesn't matter what model I'm using. I had created a self-paced unit on persuasive writing and it had all the content students needed but they didn't know why they were doing it. And so the next time around, I told my students, I want you to choose something important to you that you need skills to persuade. And I had a couple of kids choose, they had friends that were making some poor choices and they wanted to persuade their friends. I had someone, my favorite story, one of my favorite stories from teaching, I had a student who loved the Portland Trailblazers and wrote a great essay on why player X, I know very little about basketball, player X should start instead of player Y. And it was really good and he sent it to him and he got a response from him that said, if you're in Portland, we'll get you tickets. But what I learned is there has to be that purpose in place for any of this to matter. And I think that's one of the things when we're talking about students having a hard time in remote learning, are we giving them a purpose for the learning, right? I know this was emergency distance learning, but when we look towards the fall and we're thinking about how do we make meaning meaningful, me, learning meaningful for students, we have to give them a purpose and it has to be a purpose that matters to them. So, so that you can see what a mastery model looks like in my classroom, this, this is what my week looks like when we're in the building. Monday is usually something whole class. We're reading a text and we'll do a formative assessment so that on Tuesday they can use those results to plan their learning. During their independent learning time is where I get to have individual conversations with them. Wednesday is usually some small group collaboration. We go back to independent learning on Thursday, and then Friday is a celebration of learning, a class project, whatever it is. But this is a structure. And you know, if you look at this, one of the reasons I wanna show you this is because it doesn't look that different from a regular routine. It's not like you have to throw everything out the window. It's that get the structure in place, and this structure can be something familiar, but the part that needs to change is what students are working. I wanted to give an elementary example. This is my, my wife helped me with this because I, I hate when I go to a training and it's all like not super relevant to me. But the idea that this model, the only thing, and you'll notice this is really similar for elementary. The piece that I would really recommend changing is that there might be less independent work and more targeted group work, right? And I mentioned there's group-based mastery learning is in a lot of the research. And so don't feel like in only, the only way for this to work is for students to all work independently. A lot of the research says group-based mastery is just as effective, if not more effective, than an individual mastery model. The other thing that I want to point out, we, that was an in-the-building example of, of what mastery learning might look like. In remote learning, we have a really good starting point because a lot of us were dropping content weekly and we were calling it like week one, week two, week three. Here's the change. It's skill one, skill two, skill three, and now we're not time-bound but we're bound to learning. And it tells students, don't move on to skill two until you've learned skill one. This isn't about time, this is about learning. And so, you know, that's what kind of excites me about looking towards what we learned in the spring, is that we are set up so well to start really, really pursuing a mastery model at a large scale approach. But the last key that I'll say about mastery, students don't know how to do this. Right, I, I, this is kind of a joke, but I really mean it. Students know how to play a 13 year game of follow the leader until they graduate. 
And so when you tell them own your learning, that's a foreign concept to them. Have we taught them explicitly how to use YouTube to teach themselves? Right? We assume that they know how to do it, but the reality is there's a, there's, it's more than just go watch a video. It's go watch a video, identify the key concepts, explore those, test your understanding. There's a whole process that we need to be teaching. And what I found is until I taught that process of independent learning, none of this worked. It was a miserable failure. So please save yourself the failure that I went through and think about how do we teach our students to learn? So the question then is, okay, if kids are all over the place and have different attempts at learning, how do I grade it? Before I show you my grade book, there's something that I want to clarify before we get there. So I love my scenarios. I feel like I learned the most about grading through looking at it through students. So here's the setup. We've got our lovely student A and student B back. There's again, five attempts at one standard. Here are student A's scores. This time, both of them did all five. Student A got a four, a four, five, five, five. Nice work, student A. Student B got a two to start, but then they got a three, and then a four, and then fives by the end of the term. And before I even show you how to set up multiple attempts, we have to talk about how we grade multiple attempts. Because the traditional way that we grade in school uses the mean, which sends the message that where you were at at the beginning is just as important as where you ended at. It means that if you started in a better spot and ended in a better spot, that matters more than if you grew more than anyone else in the class. And so I really want to question this idea of using mean to calculate grades because that's not an accurate, if we're going back to our definition of a grade, to accurately report current levels of student learning. We failed. We're not accurately reporting the current level of learning. We're reporting the journey, right? We're reporting the average of where they started and where they ended. And that doesn't celebrate growth. And I wanted my grades, and this is why I had to rethink using means, I wanted my grade to really celebrate the growth of that process. So here's how I set up my grade book. This is what my grade book looks like. And I wanna show you that it's not as complicated as sometimes we make it seem. You'll notice up at the top, this is what I wanted my students to learn. And I created space for them to have multiple attempts. Now, as you're looking at this, you're realizing, wait, some students have more attempts than others. Yeah, because I talked with this student and I said, I'm not fully sure where you're at when you have a three, a four, and a one. So if you can prove to me that you earned a four, take another attempt at it, right? And that's the message I wanna be able to send to my students that it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter on the individual assignments, but what I care about is, did you learn it? Can you prove to me that you learned it? The question that comes up a lot of times, and I show people this is, well, how do you keep it objective? How do you make sure it's an objective report? And I'm gonna challenge, I don't really care if it's objective, I care that the grade is defensible and credible. And by looking at this, because I would argue no grading is objective, unless you're simply looking at facts. But if we're looking at learning as a process, it's impossible to be 100% objective. And I know that makes some people uncomfortable, but I've started to use the term defensible and credible. Can I prove that this is the grade the student deserves? Can I prove that the student learned in my classroom? And by doing it this way, this allowed me to really see, do I have evidence to prove that the student learned? Now, and I skipped this because I wanna talk about this really quickly. Here's the problem with using the mean and why I think it's so important that we're valuing the growth in students. So often in schools I hear this, students need to have grit and resilience. But here's what grit is. It's training the brain that when you see a threat, you don't automatically go into fight or flight. And so what that means is students need to have the opportunity to fail in ways that aren't threatening so that they can develop that grit and resilience. If we are constantly penalizing students for failing and then tell them you should have grit and resilience, we're setting up a system where they can't have grit and resilience and then expecting them to have it. And that was hard for me to realize is, I, you know, I wondered why are my students giving up, right? I, I'd heard the term learned helplessness. Why do my students have learned helplessness? And when I realized that it was based on giving students opportunities to fail in safe ways so that we can rewire their brain, I realized it wasn't learned helplessness, but I was creating forced helplessness by the systems that I was putting students in. So I would say, no matter what it looks like, 
find a way to let students have multiple attempts at mastery and don't penalize the early failures because that's where learning really happens. We fail, we figure out why, and we move forward. And that needs to be celebrated, not penalized. The reason I love getting to see multiple attempts is I can see the story of my students, right? I can see the student that struggled at the beginning and at the end they showed up and they did it and they learned it and I get to celebrate that. If I look at my grade book for especially second trimester, I have a student who had a really low middle point where they're having some family issues and I can see it in my data and I know the story of that student. And so when we talk about meaningful data, it's not just numbers. And if we can set up our grade book so that the numbers there are kids, are the story of the kids we have in our classroom, that's meaningful, right? I love getting to look at my grade book at the end of a term now because I can look at each student and I can see their story. And that matters to me. So I said, I, oh, I do have a couple minutes. Yes, multiple attempts. The point of giving students multiple attempts is giving them multiple rounds of feedback. But I know that that's daunting and time consuming. So I wanna show you two things that I use to expedite my feedback. And I'm gonna switch out of this really quick. First one I'm gonna show you is using video to create feedback. Oh, I just realized I changed this. It needs to be a comma splice, which is actually really painful for me to do again. The first time I wrote a comma splice as an English teacher, it was painful. So there it is again. Video feedback seemed impossible to me at first until I watched someone do it. And so I wanna show you how I leave video feedback. If I wanna leave feedback, I've got Screencastify, whatever screen recorder you use works. Now my poor computer is gonna have a hard time keeping up with me, so let's see if it can do it. I'm gonna open Screencastify, and I'm gonna set it so that it just starts recording my screen. So I've got it going, it's gonna take a second to go, but as it's recording my screen, what I can do is I can start talking through what's going on. So you'll notice it's giving me the countdown, it's recording, so I can say, Hey, as I'm looking at your writing, I notice you've got a comma splice here. You know, this is when you have two sentences stuck together with a comma instead of using a period, all that fun stuff. I can say it, which is way faster than actually writing it. I can even change it for them and they're watching me do this change while they're watching the video. When I stop my video, those of you that use Screencastify, it's gonna open a new tab. And what it does is it gives me a link. I copy that link. I go back to the document and I can paste that link right there. And it's that fast. And I would say the reason that I'm loving this in remote learning is so often these are the conversations I get to sit down and have with my students. And so if you're not getting to have that right now, writing the comments, I mean, we're dealing with, dealing with, we get to work with a media first generation and we're asking them, hey, go read all these comments on the side of your paper. But really what I found is when I can record a video for my students, I get so much more engagement in that feedback which is really what we want because I know, let's see if it already got, oh, did not get in there yet, because we know that too often we leave tons of feedback on writing only to find out that the student didn't look at any of it and they're making the same mistakes again and again and again. And so video feedback is one of the ways that I've helped make this feedback faster for me because I can talk way faster than I can write and more meaningful for the students. The other thing I will show you and this is kind of a little bit of a, a teaser, but those of you that have ever seen a text expander before, I wanna show you what it does. So this is something that someone showed me. I have friends that work in software and they use text expanders all the time. And they said, hey, did you know you can create a shortcut that populates a long bit of text? And as a teacher, I thought, holy smokes. Now, if I type dot ro, there's my entire comment. And here's the cool thing. Not only is it a full description of what a run-on is, but I have links to future learning. We talked about pointing students towards the future. I have follow-up assessments, so they have another attempt at it, and all of this is built in. I'll show you the program that I use. It's just called Atext. I'm showing this to you in case you wanna use it. If that works on Macs, there's one called Text Expander that works for Windows, or if you use Classroom, there's a shortcut built in for you now. Those of you that use Classroom, you've seen this over on the side, the comment bank, hopefully. If you haven't, this is your best friend. In the comment bank, you can do almost the same thing where you create comments that have links to future resources. Now, the one that I'm gonna use, please never use this for feedback on students because it's terrible. But I can leave a comment and notice if I start typing one of the keywords in there, 
it gives me a suggestion from my comment bank. I click on it, add comment, and it's in there. So when we talk about making sure we give students multiple attempts, the multiple attempt really matters if they're getting feedback in between. If not, they're just flying blind again. And so those are two ways that I found to really make this multiple attempt mastery approach manageable in the classroom. So I'm gonna end with one last thing before we have some time for Q&A. And you know, for me, all of this matters because of the kids that I've gotten to engage in learning with. And I love this, this note from one of my students sticks with me. This is from a student that came to me hating English class and hating writing. And we had a conversation mid trimester, middle, actually middle of the year, because I got to have him for the whole year where he said, you know, I'm not doing so well with my grades. And I said, why don't you try again? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Just because you didn't do well at the beginning doesn't mean you can't do well later on, right? Just because you struggled at the beginning of class, I want to celebrate your growth and I think you can get to mastery. And I could see the look on his face. And he told me, he said, kind of like what Daniel told me, is no one's really ever told me that I can do it, that I can master it and giving me that opportunity. And at the end of class, or at the end of the year, he gave me this note, and this really hammered home why mastery, why grading matters. Because we need to be creating systems that support growth. We need to be creating systems that tell students, you can do this, I believe in you. And I know it sounds silly to say that it starts with the grade book, it starts with our grading practices, but it really truly does. So I really am gonna encourage you as we end, what is the purpose of a grade in your class? And hold to that, right? Do what's best for kids, not what's best for the system, because those are gonna be the two things that are always at war with grading systems. And I found that all of this ends up being meaningful when I do what's best for kids, and then I just make it work for the system side. So with that, I will stop for today. Jeff, are there things coming up for Q&A that we could talk about? I am going to put oh. this up here in case you need some more resources uh, if you didn't get it at the beginning. But let's hear what people say. First of all, amazing, my friend. Oh, Nobody thanks, likes Jeff. to talk about grading, and yet you <laughs> did it. But I think, you know, you, you started off by saying, I think this is the perfect time of year to talk about this. Because you can go to a webinar like this and then just let, let it muster for a little bit. Come back and watch this webinar in August, but let your brain work on this a little bit. Um, I, think, I think there are ways um, that we can really use this uh, moving forward. It's so good. Um, yes, some questions. Let's get to the questions. Uh -huh. um, first one, um, how, how does this I kind of, I mean, I'll, I'm going to kind of paraphrase it here because it came up a couple times in the chat too, but how, do you, how does your system, your grade book, then transfer to you know, an online grade book? And I think that is a big question people have because of course, at some point you get put in one of these antiquated grade books and blah, blah, blah. So how do you, how do you manage that? How do you go from this multiple attempt uh, grade book that you've set up and put that into something that parents can have access to and stuff? Yeah, so a couple of ways that I've, do, I've done it, probably the, the best way that I've done it, if your grade book has a way to essentially either unpublish scores or put something due at a later date so it's not affecting their current score because it is important. Like I have my separate spreadsheet that I use that's meaningful for me, but I, it is important that parents can see it. And so I put assignments that are due at the end of the semester that are the standards. And that way it's still reported. Now, granted, that doesn't meet all the needs of the system because when we're talking, you know, or, uh, athletic eligibility and all sorts of things like that. And I've changed probably every trimester what I've done for this. <laughs> the most valuable thing that I've done though, is I have a progress assignment that goes in and I have students justify to me what grade they deserve for that. And so it, it really does, and it ends up being a conversation. And sometimes I have to have the hard talk with students of like, listen, you didn't make any progress this week, right? Like you, you just sat there and you didn't do anything. And so your progress grade is this, but, but it's nice to always let them know it, it counts for now but it's not gonna count in the end, right? And so, I, you know, I, I hate having like the, the wishy-washy answer here, but the piece that I found is I can always do what's best for kids and then find a way to make the system happen. And I agree with you. I think we cannot allow the grade system that you adopted 
drive the way that you actually do grades. There is a way that you can figure that out. And if we decide to change the way we grade, they will update the system. <laughs> they, they will do it. Uh, you know, especially I remember when we, when we went this way, International School of Bangkok, and I, we talked about this in the chat, we started reporting two grades and we reached out to them and they custom built a grade book for us. Now it costs some money, but they custom built a grade book for us so that every teacher had two grades. They had a habits, a habits, of, a habits of mind grade and a content knowledge grade, every single class in the middle school, high school. All right. Yeah. Um, another, another question, do you use a five level scale to record levels of understanding, four level, what, what do you find works? Um, I, I've gone back and forth quite a bit. I have ended up using a five point scale currently mm -hmm. just because of, I mean, the, the hard reality of where we find ourselves is eventually it's gonna have to convert to a full letter grade. You know, until right. the schools adapt, and notice that elementary schools actually already have a way that works to be able to record yeah. different standards. And, but until schools adapt, we'll have to condense down to a letter grade. And you know, I go back and forth a bunch, but what I had to realize is for me, a three means you're working towards it and you're close. And so numerically, when we get to a final letter grade that converts to a 60, and you know, if, if a student is close, I don't wanna say you, you're not ready to move on because there actually is a bunch of research behind, we, we don't have to wait for mastery to move students on, right? Like we don't have to wait until they've gotten all of it. They, if they're close and they've gotten most of it, they can fill in some gaps. So really that's the reason I like the five point scale. The one thing I will say is the fewer numbers you can have, the better, right? Even if you're operating out of a 10 point scale or a 20 point scale or the 100 point scale, yeah, the, the fewer numbers means the more reliable your information is going to be because really, I mean, I think about what's the difference between an 81 and an 83. Uh, yeah, nobody knows, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's really not an it's important a, difference. It's a B. That's yeah. it. That's all it is. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter. 2% you get the same you know, letter. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Um, In your grade book, uh, Kimberly had a really good question here. When you showed your attempts, are those attempts formative assessments or tasks that students have completed to analyze understanding? Like when you look in your grade book, those attempts, what are, what, what are those? What, what represents an attempt for you? It depends. Really, any time that a student gives me evidence of their learning, I can record it as an attempt. And, and the piece that, so I wanna make sure it's clear. I'm not saying I don't give tests in my class. I'm saying that I vary the forms of assessments so that I'm getting a holistic picture of student understanding. So a test could be one of the attempts. An essay could be one of the attempts. Um, and that's why I kind of like having the word attempt in there is because it, you know, if, if a student, instead of writing an essay, does a really cool podcast and shows me that they can organize their content, that's an attempt. So an attempt doesn't have to be doing the same assignment over and over again. Yes. And I, so often, you know, there's the debate about retakes and I understand the idea behind it, but my concern is that a retake is, is emphasizing the task and that it's important that you do well on the task again. And so, you know, I'm not going to say that retakes aren't important or we shouldn't do retakes. They can be really, really helpful. But so often I've found with my students when I say, you know, if they have the option of, Hey, go back and do the test again, or, you know, let's, let's try it with another way. So often they're like, oh, I hated the test. I don't want to do it again, but I'm fine learning it another way. And so, you know, I would say instead of retake, a, a reattempt, right? Like yeah. a, a, a retry at the learning, not necessarily at the task. And I think that is so critical because I think a, a, a lot of us get stuck in the mindset of, well, they're just, I'm just going to, you know, well, here's the worksheet again, go watch a video and then try the same worksheet. And that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about attempts. Mm -hmm. We're saying, going to the student saying, okay, let's try that again. What's another way you could show me your learning? You know, I, you, you wrote an essay, we, it was okay, but could you, could you write an email? Could you write a formative, e a formal email to somebody that is still writing? It's still going to be probably five paragraphs. Like we can still assess it in a different way. That would be another attempt. And I, I love that you, you I, I think that is so critical is there's a difference between attempts and retakes. That is a critical, critical thing, I think, to, to, to remember as we move through this. That's so good. Well, and I think even the way you just phrased it is, hey, you didn't do so well in this format. What's a way that you could, like giving them ownership over how are you going to show me the learning? 
right? Yeah. We, now we're tapping into more of that intrinsic motivation because the student's saying, here's what I could do, right? Here's my, here, I'm going to play to my strengths, yeah. but I'm going to show you this content. I love that. I love that. Um, so this was an anonymous to me. How do you take the diagnostics and multiple attempt scores and come up with a cumulative score? Do you come up with a cumulative score or do you say you got a three, a four, a five, a five, therefore you got a five? I do end up with a cumulative score and that's the score that's reported at the end of the term. And you know, I, the place that I start is I use the mode. And so I look for what's the most frequent score that they got, but there also needs to be some sense of, like if I had a student who got fours all, all the way through the trimester, and then ended with a five at the end or a couple fives at the end, the mode would say they got a four, but the story says they need a five, right? Like they, yeah. they showed that they learned it. And so I have, it's it, the grade book, the template that you can make a copy of is set up to pull the mode, but I always go through and I look for, is there evidence that they deserve something better? Mm. Um, and that's where I, it really, and that's the part that I think makes some people uncomfortable when I talk about how I grade is it feels really subjective. And that's why I really use the term defensible and credible. I love that. Defensible and credible. Yeah. I love that. And I, and I think I took that, if you've ever read, is it 15 Fixes by mm. O'Connor? I don't remember. It's in, there's a, a whole reading list of assessment books. It's one of the ones, if you need a place to start, it really identifies what are some of the current problems with how we grade. And he uses that term defensible and credible. And that, that was a game changer for me because I thought, well, no, I mean, it needs to be a multiple choice test because that's objective. Like, no, right. that's, yeah, exactly. that's not the point. We, no. yeah, right. So, yeah, I love that. Um, so another question, multiple attempts means multiple opportunities to show proficiency but how do you do that practically? You are moving through different standards while still having them work to mastery at one standard they haven't mastered right. So here's one of the things that I think can apply in different content areas, but maybe I have a, a, a advantage as an English teacher is my students are going to be writing, right? That's the vehicle. But through that, if I have a student that needs to be working on intro paragraphs and a student that needs to be working on conclusions and a student that needs to be working on transitions, I, there's a vehicle that can branch out and meet different needs. And so, you know, I, there are times where the content is more specific and I do have packaged content, which I hate phrasing it like that because it sounds like packets, but I do have <laughs> asynchronous content where students might be doing different things at different times. A lot of times I'll have, you know, this is where some flexible seating stuff can come in handy of students being able to move to different spots and find groups and work with people that are working on similar things. And I, you know, I will say it gets messy at times and there, I, I would be lying if I didn't say there were, there, there are definitely times where I have to sit down with my class and say, listen, this is all over. Like this is all <laughs> over the place. I don't really know what's, we need to figure out how to get us back on track. And you know, that's, that's why I won't say I have it all figured out. But what I found is those conversations, like students as a team, we end up back in a spot where they say, okay, we all need to work on these things and then we can figure out a better system. But yeah. I would, the big thing that's been really helpful is finding a common vehicle. And so, you know, if that's like in science, if, if you can find a phenomena that addresses multiple different concepts that students are working on, then you can still have that common vehicle and that can be what structures the class, but students then go off and approach it through different ways. Mm. I like that. And I think too, I think, you know, what the things that I love that we're talking about here and the things that you're putting, I mean, it's, it's in my mind, I, I've just seen like all of these things come together, right? This idea of flexible seating probably needs to show up in your classroom. If you're going to do this, this idea of making really good instructional asynchronous videos, probably needs to happen if you're going to do this way finding out a new strategy to somehow give feedback like you showed through video through those text hacks that you have i mean you, you need to leverage technology to allow this to work for you which i think is really the next question here is you know you're talking about you have one class have you done this with say six classes is it possible considering the time? Like what, what have you, I mean, and again, I think a, a big part of that is, is we are going to have to rethink systems. And that is the, that's the hardest thing because the educational system is the system we know. 
And it's so hard when you know your system. You don't know what you don't know outside that system. And we've got to break out of that. Mm -hmm. um, my hope is, is that's what this, these trainings at Reimagine Wa Ed now and in the future are helping to do is just think of like, oh, I didn't even know that was a possibility before. And now you do. What new avenue did that open up for you? But what have you seen across, say, six classes? How, how has this worked? What are strategies teachers are using? Yeah, so when I, when I started this, I had six classes. And, and one of the things that was really helpful for me, so I showed the, the choice grid memo, but a place for students to come back and say, this is what I learned this week. Even something as simple as on Friday, a check-in form, where students go to that form and they, they and I tell them, this, you have to prove to me that you learned it. Right? That, and so every Friday or sometime during the week have a structure where students go and say, okay, this is what I learned and I'm going to prove it. And, and the piece, what, what will be helpful, because you'll find if you try to do all of your grading outside of the class time, it does end up being more time. But, but I will say it's more time because it's more meaningful. And so what I started doing, and that's why you saw on those independent learning times, it says conferences. Those are the times where I did a lot of my grading and I loved doing it that way because I was doing it with the student. It wasn't like this weird behind the curtain Wizard of Oz thing where I was like typing in the grades and then I went back to class and pretended nothing happened. Ta-da! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was never a surprise where a student said like, whoa, that's my grade. It was, come here. Yeah. This is what I'm seeing. You know, let's talk about your score. Where are you at right now? And I think, I think a, a, a big part of what you're talking about is we have to understand that when you're no longer standing and de delivering, and, and, and sometimes you do, but you're not doing that five days a week anymore. And so now you have an hour back where you're able to have conferences. So I'm grading in the moment with my kids because I'm not trying to give content to all 30 kids at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if kids are working in flexible seating groups because these four kids really need to go focus on that and they're supporting each other on learning that standard, I can drop in on that, I can go and support them, but I really need to talk to these two kids today and I need to conference with them. And that is a part of assessment. And I, I think we have to remember that. Um, but I also think that you, we're talking about using time in the classroom differently. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the time we have to, to, make, this, to make this stuff work. There was a question that came up earlier that I thought was, that, that I wanted to hear your um, thoughts on. If people were starting to really dig in, especially when you were talking about teaching them how to learn, right? That they've been playing follow the leader for 13 years. I love that quote. I am so stealing that. Um, I won't even give you credit. I'm just taking it. Um, <laughs> but, but people were wondering, do you, how long, so my question is, how long do you find it takes to teach kids to learn? And the question that they had was, do you use resources or what resources do you have to help? Like you just quickly said, how to watch a video through learning, not entertainment right? Mm -hmm. So where is there, is there resources out there or how long, like just, how do you do that? As we start thinking about the start of next school year and we got to think about, okay, we got to get teach kids. What's that look like for you? The, the place that I started with my students is really in talking about, and I know it sounds kind of funny, but talking about the design cycle and design thinking, because that process is, is the learning process where you identify a problem, you, look for resources to find the solution, you create a solution, you test the solution and you repeat. And so even just something as simple as that was helpful. One of the, the piece that's really helpful for me with my students is asking them, what's the last thing you taught yourself? Mm. Because a lot of them, I mean, I have students like when, a lot of them talk about video games. They're like, ah, I learned how to beat this level. Uh, that, and I'm like, okay, how'd you do it? And they're like, well, I tried and I failed. And then I tried and I failed. And then I tried and I failed. And then I looked something up on YouTube where someone showed me how to do it. And then I tried it again and I was able to do it. And like, the problem isn't that they don't know how to engage in it. The problem is that they don't know how to transfer it to the school realm. Yeah. And so um, I have like an, a little infographic I use with my students where it, it's a process that they, they start by following of, do you know what you need to learn? And if the answer is yes, here's your next step. If the answer is no, figure out what you need to learn. And so it, I will say that the question of how long does it take them to learn it? It depends on the student. And what I found honestly is the ones that have been good at school take the longest to learn it. Yeah. Because they are terrified of doing something wrong. And that means they're terrified of taking the risk of teaching themselves. So it's, it's you know, I would say as we're talking about the fall, that piece of teaching students how to be a learner is going to be so important. I would take a week 
at the beginning. And, you know, I don't know, nobody knows how long it takes anyone to learn anything. That's the point <laughs> of mastery. But I would devote some serious time to engaging students in processes and, and you know, maybe your asynchronous videos are, here's what it means to be a learner and start there. I agree with you. I think as we not, not knowing specifically next school year, how any school district's going to start, right? Cause every school district is probably going to start a little bit differently because that's what the state has said. you you have the option to do. I think we need to really take a hard look on how do we help kids know how to learn and, and learn in the classroom, but also what are strategies to help you learn at home? Because if you're going to be a, a if you're going to be somebody who works from home and let's just face it, this is forever here. When Facebook has come out and said, you will forever have the opportunity to work from home. When companies are coming out and say, you will forever have the opportunity to learn at home. That is a new skill that we need to teach kids because they're going to need to know that when you have a job in the future, you still need to get up and take a shower. You, you need to have a routine. So we're going to have to build in time at the beginning of the year to how do you learn best and how do you learn when you're at home and there isn't somebody standing in front of you saying, hey, wake up. And that's a different skill. That's mm -hmm. a different skill. And we're going to have to teach that at all grade levels. Because that, but to me, it's not a skill that we're teaching because we are in the situation we're in. That's a skill because that's the future of work. And so well, we have to, we, you have to re remind that as well. Thanks for posting your infographic too. Appreciate it. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I love. Once I have my students in a spot where they know how to engage in this learning process, I mean, I, I get to a point in my class halfway through the year where I'll show up with a lesson plan and I'll say, hey, listen, we, we're going to learn about symbolism. Like that's what we're doing today. You want me to teach you or you guys would just want to learn it? And I, I love, you know, the first time I do it, I actually have the lesson plan and they're like, we got this. And I tell them the non-negotiable is you all learn this. And I give them an assessment that they can use to check their understanding. But it's, I mean, as a teacher, it's so nice to not be the one responsible for all of the content, but to let students know. And I tell them, I said, I should be able to give you a learning objective and an assessment and you got it, right? Like that's how I know I've succeeded because that means when you leave the classroom and there's no teacher that you're gonna know how to learn. And really, is there anything more important than sending students out of our classroom with that ability? Yeah, this was a good one. What kind of attempts would you suggest in a math classroom? I'm not sure a podcast would work, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so what, um, what have you seen or what would you think about in a math classroom? So I think one of the things that, that is really helpful is if there is some way for students to explain, explain their thinking. So like even having them create screencasts. And, and one of the things that I've seen a math teacher do that's really, really cool is they give students a wrong, like multiple wrong solutions and the student has to explain why the answers are wrong mm. and you talk about seeing a depth of understanding of the content when they have to look at it and say here's the problem and i mean that also reinforces a, the skill of becoming a problem finder and then a problem solver yeah. and so giving them opportunities to say here's a wrong answer if you can prove to me why this is wrong there's one of your attempts yeah um i you know i i have seen some good examples of teachers having students curate the best teaching resources on a topic as an attempt to show their learning. I, you know, that might not be the most valid and reliable source, but that's why, you know, I would say, that's why I didn't want to take tests off the table, why I didn't want to take projects off the table, because the goal is that those attempts should be varied, right? They should be different types of assessments so that you can get a full and complete picture. Because when we rely, we rely, and I love that you're asking this question about what are the other ways we could assess math, because so often if we rely too heavily on one type of assessment, well, if the student's not good at that type of assessment, they're done, right? Like yeah. the, their possibility for success is, is shattered. And if they don't get multiple attempts, I flunked the test. I'm not good at math. Why am I going to try again? Yeah, right? exactly. And, and that, so then we get into this, we get into this not growth mindset. And then, and then you're, you're undoing that. You're trying uh -huh. to undo that. I think something else, I mean, we talked about it a little bit, is I would, I could, I could totally see myself sitting down with the kid going, you know what, you took that test and it sucked. Like, dude, that was horrible. And I know you know this stuff. How else could you show that you know this for me? Like, can you, you know, figure out where, where's this equation used in the real world? Can you show me someplace that you can apply this somewhere out this classroom? Or, mm -hmm. hey, I hear you like playing Minecraft. Is there some way you could use Minecraft to show me this, you know, how you find the hypotenuse of a triangle in Minecraft. Go build some crazy pyramid and show me how you figured out how to measure it or something, you know? I think, again, anytime you can turn that over 
um, mm -hmm. on kids and say, man, you know what? You really sunk that one up, but I know you know it. And I want to give you another attempt. What, would, what might that look like? How can you, how can you show me? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think when I started, I was really afraid to allow them to choose the product that they were going to create. But I've learned slowly, probably slower than I should have learned, that really almost any product the student makes will allow them to explain their process to me. And that's mm -hmm. what matters because when they explain, here's how I was showing the math, that's where I, I can figure out really quickly, did you understand it or not? And so, you know, as we look at different attempts, make that attempt includes some sort of explanation of process, whether it's a verbal explanation through, I saw someone mentioned Flipgrid, you know, explain your answer, or if they're recording a, a screencast or just submitting a video or something, with, or even in writing, explain your process, right? How yeah. were you showing the math here? And you can almost always get the information you need out of that explanation. I agree. I think video, I mean, I'm so, I, people are so sick and tired of me saying video, 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 but in math <laughs> class, I really believe in math class, it, I mean, the research back when I was doing my elementary ed program, I was a part of a research project where we were all, it was all about math talk with our math professor and getting kids to talk through math. And you learn so much when, and that's what video is. It's kids talking through the process and you can tell exactly what they're thinking. You know, that, that is, that is huge. A um, couple others, and now there are a lot of coming in. So I don't know if you need to leave, tell, tell us to stop. No, um, I'm good. <laughs> all right. Do you give partial credit for assignments? There has been lots of discussion at my school department of 50% for missing work, or does this not apply because students report their own progress grade? So this is, and that's part of the reason that I really like not having the assignments in the grade book because I, that's almost a debate I don't have to worry about. Now I have discussions with students where if, if, if they only give me one or two attempts to show their learning, a lot of times I'll tell them, hey, I don't have complete evidence, right? Like, yeah. and so at that point, I won't tell you what to do, but at that point saying you earned a four, you earned proficient, you earned, you can't say that. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, and I would I, say, I, go, go ahead. Sorry. If, if I can get enough evidence that I know that I have a defense, defensible and credible report of their learning, then I don't, I don't record the missing stuff because and I, yeah, that goes I to the that. purpose. I love that. I love the idea of evidence. I don't have enough evidence. I, you know, I, I just need, I need to see one more piece. You know, I need something from you, kiddo. You know, I just, I'm just not because I need something that's defensible. You know, can you just give me one, just give me one more thing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and I think again, anytime, especially, and I would even say as a fourth grade teacher, I could do that with my fourth grade kids. Like, ah, I need just, you're almost there. I need one more thing so I can give you the go. Right. Um, and you're that encourager. You're, that is the mm -hmm. growth. I'm here to support you. What are we going to do? Let's figure this out. I need, I just need some more evidence from you, kiddo. Um, yeah. I think anytime you can be their cheerleader like that, I think that really helps. Um, yeah. And the, the other thing too, with my concern with putting in partial work or zeros is you can get to a spot in the, the year where the student can't be successful, right? Like you get 70% of the way through the term and the student already knows I can't get an, I, I can't get an A, I can't get a B, I can't get a C. And that completely changes their experience with the learning. And so mm -hmm. that's why I've tried to figure out how do I create systems where it's possible for them to be successful at any point. Right. Mm -hmm. Even if if they got a two, a two, a two, a two, a two, and we're a week away from the end and they suddenly dive in and do all of this learning and they get a five. Awesome. Right. I'll probably awesome. want another. I'll probably want another example. So they show me that that's yeah. not just a fluke, I need some but... more evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that. Um, the other components of your grade book included behaviors and life skills pieces. How did you factor those into your cumulative grade? Are there standards for those? Do you know them? Did you know them ahead of time? Do they know them? Sorry, do they know them ahead of time? So I, I don't actually put them into the grade book at all. Um, I, I have my separate reporting piece on the spreadsheet and the five of the 10 are actually, our school has a power is our acronym and they're kind of the behaviors we want to see in our school. And so that's what five of them are. The other ones are some of the 21st century skills or future ready skills that, you know, creative thinking and problem solving and things like that, that I want my students to engage in. And really what I use those for is I run a report about every two weeks and give that to students. And that's where they see the behavioral piece. 
of some of those skills. And probably the most valuable piece is during conferences is then I can bring that to conferences because we know that's really parents, obviously they wanna know is my student learning, but they also wanna yeah. know how are they behaving. And it's, right. you know, so that's really helpful to have for those conversations as well. But yeah. they, they don't end up actually going in the, the digital grade book that reports their cumulative grade at the end. Yeah. And like I, I talked in the chat, and I'm trying to get a, um, I'm trying to get the transcript that we created at the International School of Bangkok. But our actual transcript, when you, uh, when you graduate as a senior, and it's all through middle school and high school, but your transcript has two grades on it. It has the work ethic grade, life skill grade, and it has a content knowledge grade. And that is how we got over the idea. And somebody put in the chat, you know, well, due dates still matter. They do matter, but mm -hmm. but due dates matter on can you hit a deadline? Not do you know the content? And I'm not going to hold you responsible for knowing the content. But yeah, it does count <laughs> when I'm looking at this other grade. And, and when you split those out, oh my gosh, I, I found it just feel like so much easier mm -hmm. because I actually have, and, and you have something, for lack of a better term, to hold over their head mm -hmm. because you have this other grade that is life skills, that is behavior, habits of learning, whatever you want to call it. Um, that that factors into those things as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I love that. Do you yeah, have any methods for teaching uh, and helping students interpret how they learn best? What does that look like in your classroom? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I have an answer for how they learn best, but I think one of the things that I emphasize early on with my students is helping them discover their passions. Because a lot of times you can tease out of that what they what medium they might engage in best. And so for example, like if I have a student that I know loves video games, I know that one of the things that they're comfortable with already is the idea of failure and retrying. And so I, you know, I I can talk to them about, you know, make that connection. Hey, in video games, do you do you want a game that you just finish without ever dying? And they're like, no, that would be a terrible game. And I'm like, yeah, so <laughs> the idea of failure is totally okay. And it means you're engaging in something meaningful and it's hard. And so, you know, I, if someone has a great example of how to identify how students learn best, but the, I guess the other piece I'll say is, you know, I know for a, a there was a lot of stuff around, oh, what was it called? Like the type of learner that you were. Yeah. And for a while, people were pushing that, you know, you're either a, you're a visual learner, you're an auditory learner. You're, and there's been more research recently saying that no person is an isolated type of learner. Now, they may have strengths, but it's best if they're getting all types of learning and maybe emphasizing one or two or something yeah. like that. So, but if someone does have a way of identifying, helping students identify way, ways that they learn best, I would love to hear it. And, well, I like the thing that we were doing through the Reimagine Washington Ed, where uh, in our uh, session nine or session eight, your last session or, um, that you had with us, where you, you wrote down what are four things or five things you could teach others to do. And then how did you learn to do those things? And then in my sessions with people, I had them like, look at that then, like take a 10,000 you know, foot level and say, do you see any patterns? And if you see patterns in the way you learn, and it doesn't matter whatever it is, if you see patterns in it, that is you, that's, that's how you learn best. Do you learn best through stories? Do you learn best through trial and error? Do you need to research something before you can jump in and do it? And these are all ways that learning occurs for different learners, right? That's also culturally responsive teaching. But um, I just love that activity of what could you teach others to do and how did you learn how to do that, right? And you start to gather that evidence of this is how you learn as a learner. And mm -hmm. if this way didn't work for you, let's debrief that. Why doesn't this work for you? Let's try another way. Okay? Mm -hmm. I love that idea. Well, thank you so much. We have kept you for an extra half hour and I appreciate you hanging out with us, Tyler. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. Of course, as we get into this, the questions are getting more and more sophisticated. <laughs> and at some point you have to say, we don't know yet, right? Like, we're just doing this. But um, thank you so much for giving us your time uh, and your energy in this. I can't say that enough. Uh, I've just blown away. I love it. Um, know that uh, if those of you that have gone through Reimagine 1.0, that uh, part of what Tyler is talking about will be part of Reimagine 2.0 as well. We're going to continue to go deeper into this, give you some space and time and support you into what this looks like. Uh, so please stay tuned for that. You can find more information over at the reimaginewaed.com website uh, as we continue to move forward. This will be up on YouTube. 
It will also be a podcast on Shifting Our Schools podcast, if you're a podcast listener, and it'll be over on the Reimagine Washington Ed website under the resource page. So plenty of places for you to find it. Thank you everyone for sticking with us. Happy last day or two of school, wherever you happen to be. Um, until next time, we'll see you on the network. Thank you, Tyler. Hey, everybody. Thank you.